Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. Today, we are doing my favorite video to film of the whole year, and that is reading booktubers' favorite books. I've done this for a few years now, and it is always the most fun, and I end up finding so many amazing books. Last year, three of the books that I read were five stars and ended up being my favorites of the whole year. So fingers crossed, this year goes just as well. So essentially what I'm gonna be doing is as booktubers are uploading their favorite books of 2022 videos, I'm going to be watching all of them, compiling lists, and figuring out what books I'm gonna be reading for this vlog. The criteria that I am looking for is I'm gonna be reading the top five most mentioned books from all of the booktubers that I follow. And then something new for this year is I wanna find the booktuber who I have the most favorites books in common with, and whoever that booktuber ends up being, I will read one book from their list. And hopefully at the end of this, I end up having some new favorite books, some new five stars. And just like last year, I hope that this pushes me to read books that I never would have picked up or weren't on my radar at all, that I end up giving five stars. You know what I love about this standing desk? Can use it as a tripod. Oh my god, this is game changer. Ignore my empty bookshelves. It's a tragedy, I know. I do want to make some predictions of what I think is going to be in a lot of booktubers lists. What I think is gonna pop up, what I think I'm gonna be reading, the books that I think are gonna pop up, I've been requesting from my library. The number one book that I think I'm gonna see, I have no doubt. I'm gonna see is Babel by RF Kuang, which I'm kind of mentally preparing myself to read that. Maybe tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. That did win the Goodreads choice for general fiction. And I feel like everyone I saw read it really loved it. I feel like book lovers is gonna come up a lot. I think of all of Emily Henry's, like her three romances, book lovers has been the most like widely spread popular with like not just in romance booktube, but like across all genres. So I would not be surprised to see that a lot. For like indie romance, I think the number one book that I'm gonna see is either Flawless or Heartless by Elsie Silver. Those were both so popular last year. I already read Flawless, but I feel like I'm gonna see a combination of those on, I I'm willing to bet like most of the romance booktubers that I follow, I feel like everybody was reading those. So yeah, those are my main predictions. I feel like those four are the main ones that I am betting I'm gonna see. All right, so it is December 23rd and <laughs> there's already a bunch of booktubers favorites videos that have been posted and I've been putting them all into a playlist. And as I've been watching them, I've been filling out all the books that they're mentioning onto this spreadsheet. As I'm going through and inputting all of these lists into the spreadsheet, I am color coding them. So far, I've watched videos from Meg with Books, Bruise Project, How to Train Your Gavin, Ashley's Little Library, and Reading Riley. As of right now, we have three different books that are mentioned on multiple lists. Babel was in both Megan and Reagan's videos. Confessions was in Gavin and Ashley's videos. And then We Spread was in Ashley's and Reading Riley's. And then so far, the only booktuber of these five who have books that are also my favorites is Gavin. He had both Finlay Donovan and Project Hail Mary. So far, he's in the lead for the booktuber that I have the most in common with. However, I feel like there's gonna be somebody else who I have more in common with. So that's where we're at right now as of December 23rd. And I'm just gonna keep updating as more and more videos come out. All right, it is January 1st and there have been some updates. At this point, we have new videos that I've watched from Gabby Reads, Katie Colson, The Story Ain't Over, Katrina Brown, Basically Brit, Books and Lala, Jan Agaton, Life as Monet, Stories for Coffee, The Book Leo, Sarah Without an H, Taya's Turning Pages, and we have new updates. So Confessions was also on Kayla, Katie, and Jan's videos. We Spread showed up in Gabby and Jan's videos, and then A Certain Hunger was in Jan, Elizabeth, and Brit's videos. So 
as of right now, here is our leaderboard for the top books mentioned. Babel at two, A Certain Hunger at three, We Spread at four, and Confessions at five. Now for the booktubers that I have the most in common with, as a reminder, Gavin is leading the board, but Katie also has two books in common with me, and that is A Curious Beginning and Slewfoot. But then just as I expected, Kayla came in with three books in common with me, knocking off both Katie and Gavin from the leaderboard. So the books that Kayla and I have in common are Finlay Donovan, The Book of the Most Precious Substance, and The Fifth Season. So currently Kayla is at the top of the leaderboard and if I was making a prediction before doing this, she would have been one of the people that I would have placed near the top. So I'm curious to see if anyone else in the next batch of videos that I watch has more than three books in common with me, but so far Kayla is at the top. All right, it is January 10th and this is the deadline for videos that I'm going to be taking into consideration. So we have a lot of new booktubers who I have watched. We have Mel Lenore Reads, Deja's Book World, Cat Chats, Covers with Cassidy, Kaylee's Books, Bookish Realm, Books with Lexi, Amy Noel Reads, Elias, My Name is Marinez, Mandy's Morgue of Horror, Michelle's Library, Books with Leo, Ola Books, Olivia Reads a Latte, Hannah Blackwell, Alexandra Roslin, and Burrows and Books. And we have so many updates. As a reminder, here is our leaderboard of books. So let's just go over the books that we've already covered that have shown up on even more lists. So A Certain Hunger was also in Kat's video, which brings that total up to four booktubers. We Spread also showed up on Cammie's video, which brings that one up to five booktubers. Confessions showed up in Lexi, Kaylee, and Gabby's videos, which brings that one up up to eight booktubers. The Weight of Blood showed up in six of these videos, that being Kaylee, Lexi, Katie, Amy, Deja, and Olivia. So that means that these are the top books mentioned by the most booktubers, with Confessions being the one that's mentioned the most. I feel like that is just so surprising to me because this book came out in like 2006. Seven. It's quite an older book, so to have it show up on this many booktubers list I think was very surprising. However, I do remember that a few book clubs had this as so their selections last year, so I guess that makes sense, but it's also just super surprising. And can we talk about how none of my predictions were correct? Babel only ever showed up on those original two videos. Nobody else mentioned Babel. Tomorrow, Tomorrow, and Tomorrow only showed up in one video. Book Lovers showed up in two videos. So yeah, my predictions were just like super bad. So from most mentioned to least mentioned, these are the four most favorited books from booktubers in 2022 that I will be reading in this video. You might be noticing at this point that I have left out romance booktubers. I have been saving all of the romance booktubers favorites videos and tomorrow I'm gonna be looking through all of them and finding the one romance book that is the most mentioned out of all of them. So that will be the last book that I'm finding. Right now what we need to do is update our leaderboard for the booktuber that I have the most in common with. As a reminder, Kayla from Books and Lala is currently at the top with three books. She knocked out Gavin and Katie. So tying with Kayla, we have Hannah, who also has three books in common with me, Into the Drowning Deep, The Last Housewife, and Legends and Lattes. Then with five books in common with me, we have Michelle, who has Dead Silence, In My Dreams I Hold a Knife, Station Eleven, My Best Friend's Exorcism, and The Push. And at this point, I thought, okay, there's nobody else who's gonna have more than five books in common with me. Michelle is the winner. However, somebody came in, swooped in at the last minute, and that is Alexandra, who has six books in common with me. And those are Finlay Donovan is Killing It, My Best Friend's Exorcism, Where the Drowned Girls Go, Ledges and Lattes, Nettle and Bone, and The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches. That means we have a winner. Alexandra Roslin is my booktube twin. <laughs> 
So I will be choosing a book from her list and there were a very limited number of choices because over half of her list were my favorite books. And then she also had House of Hunger on her favorites list, which I've already read and I did enjoy. It just It's just not a favorite. So of the three books left on her list, the one that I'm going to be choosing and reading in this video is These Fleeting Shadows by Kate Alice Marshall, which I'm so excited to read. I love Kate Alice Marshall and I've been looking for an excuse to read this book. Unfortunately, I've already packed this book away in my boxes because I'm moving in like a couple days <laughs> and I have been keeping out the books that were like showing up in a lot of the videos just so I, would, I didn't pack them, but I wasn't expecting this one to be something that I was reading in this video. So it's probably gonna have to wait until after I move. Maybe filming this video while I'm in the process of moving wasn't the best idea, but we're doing it, we're making it work. And I'm so excited. And I'm, I'm actually very surprised that Alexandra is the booktuber that I have the most favorites in common with, but I have only started watching her channel more recently, like within the past a couple of months. I don't know, I'm just very excited. I cannot wait to read this book. And honestly, I, I can't wait to read all of these. What's interesting, and I noticed happened last year as well, where of the, like, the top books, two of them, were books that I was already planning on reading or had on my TBR. And then the other two were books that I never would have picked up had I not been doing the video, which again has happened this year. I already owned both of these books and have made plans to read them. And then these two were ones that just like really weren't on my radar at all. So I'm very excited to read all of these and these fleeting shadows. And then whatever is the romance book that I find out is the most favorited from all of the romance booktubers that I follow. Okay, I want to take a quick moment here to talk about the sponsor of this video, which is Bright Settler. I've worked with Bright Settler a few times now, and they are one of my favorite sponsors to have because they bring you personalized wine to fit your taste. All you have to do is go onto their website and take their seven question quiz to find your tasting profile. And based on that quiz, they will match you with wines from all over the world that are then sent directly to you so you don't have to waste any time in the store trying to find something that you like. One of my favorite things is that each box comes with these wine education cards with tasting notes, pairings, serving temperatures, and origin of all of the wines so you can learn about them and find the best ways to serve them. Each box that you get improves as you are trying more wines and rating them on the website. They will continue to match you with the best wines for your taste and their concierge team Team is also always available to answer any questions. I really love the convenience and the ability to try a ton of different wine from all over the world. I've talked about this in my previous videos with Bright Cellar, but I am still very much a novice to wine, and I've just really been enjoying trying out as many different kinds as I can. Tonight's wine tasting um, is actually taking me back to my roots. I'm having a little Riesling, which, fun fact, before I ever started experimenting and tasting more wines, Riesling was always what I would go for, mostly because it was the only wine that I'd ever heard of. So when I would go into the store, I would be like, that's a word I recognize. <laughs> this one is the Sunshower Riesling from Washington. The notes are pear, peach, lemon zest, and honeysuckle. And right now they have the best limited time offer that they have ever had, which is up to $100 off your first four boxes of wine. And you can get this offer by going to the link in the description. Thank you to a bright sellers for sponsoring this video, especially this one in particular as so much work went into it. It took me so much time and I just love working with Bright Seller. Cheers! So now we need to look at all of the romance booktubers and the one romance that showed up the most amongst all of their videos. Here are all of the romance booktubers that I watched videos from and of all of these, eight of them had one book in common and that book is Heartless by Elsie Silver which as you guys heard in my prediction earlier this was the one that I was predicting would show up on a bunch of videos and it did and I'm so glad because I am dying to read this. I read Flawless towards the end of last year and it ended up being one of my favorite romance books of the year so I cannot wait to read this and what was so interesting about this one is that not only was this the most mentioned romance book like I said it was on eight 
booktubers lists the majority of those eight booktubers not only had this on their list but this was their number one favorite romance of the year so this book is so loved and i cannot wait to read it now that we have all six books that i'm going to be reading in this video let's get to the actual reading confessions by kane minato translated by stephen snyder this is about a teacher and she is giving the last kind of lecture to her students on like the last day of her being employed there and a few months before she had a daughter who died on the school premises and she tells the kids of this classroom i know two of you murdered her the story is told in i believe six chapters and you get different perspectives in almost every chapter so you're reading these long stories that are are coming in different pieces of time and it's trying to like build the whole puzzle together for you as you're understanding from all these different perspectives and it's about the teacher's actions in revenge and how this revenge kind of spirals out of control and affects so many more people than just the students she was trying to take revenge upon the ripple effect of the cause and causation and the guilt and like what guilt will lead you to do and like that guilt it can be a way bigger motivator or shame can be a way bigger motivator than anything this one has a very unique concept very original i really enjoyed how this book was formatted it read very fast this is so well done well written well executed from start to finish and by the end when you start piecing things together it's literally mind-blowing so i've been on a live stream with my patrons for most of today and i've been reading confessions Oh my god, I'm loving it so much. Okay, so what is this about? Basically, this takes place in Japan and you're following a bunch of different characters. There's six chapters. In each of the chapters, you're following a different character's perspective all surrounding the um, after effects of this one major event that happened. First character that we're following is a teacher at the school. Her young daughter was found dead at the school and she believes that some of her students are responsible. So the book starts off with her giving a speech to her students, sort of confessing everything that has happened up to this point. So it's all told from second person. As the reader, we are like one of her students in her class listening to her give this speech. What is so, so freaking cool about this is that the end of every chapter ends with like, a jaw-dropping plot twist literally jaw-dropping it's like twist on twist on twist on twist she really said y'all want a twist how about 10 and then you switch to another character's perspective who is telling their side and sort of continuing this series of events that started with the death of this child and just spiral out of control and it almost feels like a jigsaw puzzle where every single chapter and every new perspective that you're in, you're getting a new piece of information in order to see the whole picture. And I really like how when every perspective starts, it doesn't immediately tell you whose perspective you're in. The chapters are all like a title. So the first perspective is the saint. Then we have the martyr, the benevolent one, the seeker. Some of them, it's very easy immediately to figure out who it is. Other chapters, it does take like a page or two to figure it out. I have one perspective left to read and I am just like, I don't even know how this is going to change all the events. I'm already feeling like this is gonna be five stars. So let me read this last perspective and then come back and I'll give you my final thoughts. The woman was too stunned to speak. Five stars, five stars. That ending, I don't even have words. This was amazing. Now I understand why this is the most popular loved book from booktubers in 2022. I get it now, I get it. I was like, why is this random book from like 2008? Why is everyone loving this? Um, I understand now. I get it now, I get it, I get the hype. That was incredible. I was so worried after the first chapter because the first chapter was so good. And honestly, that first chapter could have been a short story and it would have been a five star short story. I was like, how else is the rest of the book gonna top this? And it just kept getting better and better and better and better and building to something. And the ending, the ending was epic. The ending was 
Perfect. This is one of those books that I feel like I ha am having a hard time categorizing because it's not horror, but it's very horrific. It's not a thriller, really, but it is thrilling. You know, it could be a thriller. I think that maybe this could be the difference between like a Western style of writing thrillers versus an Eastern world style of writing thrillers. This is the first Japanese like thriller I've ever read because to me, this didn't follow like a typical structure for a thriller book but again that could just be a more like eastern structure but like i don't know what i would classify this as either way this was incredible as a lover of revenge oh my god the revenge in here epic Epic. I think this poses a lot of very interesting discussions and this is a book that I really really wish I had read with a book club I know this was a few booktubers book club books in 2022 Which I think is why a lot of people had read it last year Just the idea of the lengths that people will go to for revenge the ripple effect that that has how every single perspective that you read in this book Everyone thinks that they're in the right. This is so Good. I will say if there is any like negative to this book, like I said, there's like five chapters in here and they're all like 60 page chapters they're very long chapters um so i could see this being dense to read physically i listened to the audiobook and read it physically and i do think that the the style of this narration lends way better to an audiobook format because all of the characters are like speaking to the audience so it just it sounds better out loud than i think it would physically reading it so my recommendation would be to get the audiobook for this but yeah like i don't have a single bad thing to say about this we started off this video with a five star um, i'm hoping that that is like foreshadowing for how the rest of the video is gonna go and that it's not gonna take a complete nosedive but we have our first win we spread by ian reed it is about a woman who partner has passed away she doesn't really have anyone and she is sent to live in a assisted living facility and then once she gets there she starts having increasing issues with her memory and the passage of time and understanding if she's in a safe environment if you like an ambiguous ending if you like a book that's terrifying that takes real life horror and turns it into a work of fiction and if you like something that makes you think like this book hit me where it hurts this is definitely one of those books that i think changed my life and it impacted me in a way that i don't even know how to explain i think this is a book that i could universally recommend to anyone who's experienced anything in life and has a passion for anything all right so i started we spread um i'm a little bit into it right now it's very interesting the writing style it's told in like little vignettes almost and there's not really chapters at all but it's like every couple of pages has like a page break so it's reading very, very quickly. Basically what has happened so far is that our main character is this elderly woman and her partner recently died. So she's living on her own and she was doing something in her home and she fell and hit her head and the landlord comes over and says okay now it's time for you to go to this you know long-term care facility this is what you and your partner you know set up and, and planned for whenever the time was right but she doesn't remember ever discussing that so she gets to this facility that is very small there's only like five residents there and two faculty members i'm feeling very like conflicted about this book. It's written very, very well. However, I feel a little bit uncomfortable because I feel like I'm reading like my grandma's diary because my grandma right now is in an Alzheimer dementia care facility and has a very similar, similar story where like her husband died, she fell and hit her head, and that just like progressed all of these issues and um, she has dementia now. So she's living in this care facility and you know, forgets everything, doesn't have a concept of time anymore, hallucinates things, and I'm feeling, I, it just feels so uncomfortable, and this might sound crazy, but I've never considered the perspective of my grandma, like, going through this, obviously, because, like, I'm on this side of it, and I can just see how, you know, having a family, a relative who is going through something like that affects the family members, like, I see how it affects my family, and, you know, everything that, that they have to take on and deal with as a result of that, and I think I've almost, like, distanced myself a little bit from it, and, like, I've never considered what 
it must feel like to be the person that is going through that. And so this book is kind of making me feel uncomfortable, but like, I feel like it's an uncomfortability that like I've needed to confront and I just haven't. I mean, I'm really enjoying it. I'm loving the writing style. This is the first book by Ian Reid that I have read. So I definitely would be willing to pick up something else from him, depending on how the rest of this goes, but I am enjoying it. Like I said, it just is a little bit uncomfortable because it feels too close to home. So I finished We Spread. This was a very quick book to read, but I feel very conflicted about it. I really don't know how I feel, if I liked it, if I didn't like it. I do think that this poses a lot of very interesting questions and topics. One of the ones that kept coming up, aside from like the themes of the book, because this is marketed as a horror book, but something that I kept thinking about was how we define horror. I think that there are two types of horror. I mean, obviously there's hundreds of types of horror, but I really think that all horror can fit into two different categories. And I think that these two categories really affect the way that people read them and how people feel about them. And that is, who is the audience of the horror. Is the horror in the book for the reader to be scared or is the horror for the main character to be scared? Sometimes they can intersect and it's scary for the main character and it's scary for the reader. Sometimes it's just for the reader and other times, this being an example, it's for the main character. In the eyes of the main character, this is a horror book. This is terrifying. What is happening to her is terrifying. But since as readers, we're outside of that and we can theorize what is actually going on, it's not inherently scary for the reader. Now, some people could read this and be absolutely terrified of it because they have a fear of getting older, losing their memory. But I think intentionally, this is a horror that is horror for the main character, but not necessarily for the reader. I hope I'm making sense with this. It's something that I've been thinking about for the past like two days. And it is an interesting conversation around what classifies as horror, because I do know a lot of people would probably say this is not horror because it's not scary to the reader, which that's fair. But again, I think that there are different intentions when it comes to horror and who is the audience. And this is definitely one of those books that is terrifying for the main character. I also think the ways that this book approached horror aside from what I already said was very interesting because I think there's two different ways to interpret this book you could be a reader who really like is leaning into this like supernatural unknowingness of what is going on or you could be a reader who focus on the reality of it and for me that was kind of how I approached it is looking more at the reality and I think that this book really showcased the horror in reality, how our realities is terrifying. Losing your memory, terrifying. Becoming sort of a cast off in society where you no longer have loved ones, you don't have a support system, society has kind of left you behind, terrifying. And that's something that, you know, as humans, we're all sort of approaching every single day. Like you could read this and really look into the unexplained things, the weird phenomena, a potential supernatural angle. But I think the real horrific aspect of it is just the fact that this is reality. And I think what makes it so eerie and jarring is that it forces you to confront that inevitability. I think I had such conflicting feelings about this book, not because of the book, or how it was written or any fault of the book, but I just was like, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> I don't think I loved this as much as, you know, everyone else who gave this five stars. So I think I'm going to give it four stars. It was really great. And I think it would be a very interesting book to discuss with people. This is going to be a theme with a lot of these books that I'm reading in this video, but I wish that I was reading these for like book clubs to discuss with a lot of people because these are all books that bring up just so many topics that I want to talk about. But yeah, this is four stars. For my first Ian Reid book, I really did enjoy it. I did cry at the end. It was very sad. I'm glad that I read this because this really was not on my radar at all prior to this video. The Weight of Blood. This is a Carrie retelling, but it's in 2014, set in this small town, Georgia, where they still have segregated proms. This is a real thing that happens in America in some small towns in 2014. Tiffany D. Jackson writes about real life events and turns them into horror books for her YA audience. In this book, we follow our main character and she has kind of hidden her black identity. She's very light skinned and she straightens her hair and she literally does not go to school if it's raining that day, nothing because um, her father, who's actually white, she's biracial. Her father's white and her mom was black. Her mother is not in the picture, but her father does not want her to be found out as black at all. So this pretty much does follow the story of Carrie 
She gets bullied at the beginning, things happen, she discovers her telekinetic powers, and the whole time we know that something bad happened at the prom. So we are following everything leading up to that. I actually cried for this main character. It is heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking, the stuff that she has to go through. And the audiobook is the way that I'd recommend listening to it because you have a podcast that's basically detailing what happened at prom and they have like the sounds of it being a podcast. It sounds like one truly that you're listening to like on Spotify or something. So I finished The Weight of Blood. I've actually been waiting to start talking about this until I finished it because I was not enjoying it. I did not want to come up on here and say that I was not liking this book. So I was waiting until I finished. So what this book is about, this is essentially a retelling of Carrie. It takes place in 2014 in this town that still has segregated proms, which is actually true. There was a high school in 2014 that was actually still having segregated proms and or following the main character Maddie who is the Carrie character and basically she is biracial her mother is black and her father is white her mother died right after she was born so she's been raised by her white father her whole life and he was very ashamed of the fact that he had a black child and so he forced her to pass as white he forces her to straighten her hair every single day and never tell anybody that she's black. So the book starts out with Maddie at gym class and she's running on the track field outside and it starts to rain and her hair gets wet and that sort of exposes her to the school that she is black. And then because of that, she becomes the target of bullying and racism from other students at the school. There is a podcast that takes place present day that is sort of talking about the Springville prom massacre. And there was this huge massacre that happened at the prom that was Maddie's fault. And the podcast is sort of investigating if she is still alive. And then we're also following back in 2014, the perspective of a bunch of different characters, one being Maddie. We're following the perspective of a couple of the students at the school, a teacher, all these different characters that are sort of connected. Why wasn't I enjoying this? There's a couple barriers, I think, that kept me from liking this book. I did end up liking it by the second half, but the first half was very much a struggle for me to get through for a couple reasons. One being you're in the perspective of a few different characters who are so despicable and being in their head is not fun, which I am aware that that is the intention. You're not supposed to pick up a book and read from the perspective of a racist and be like, I'm having a great time. That's the point, but it did make it hard to get through. And the other thing was I just, don't like reading books that take place in high school. I don't mind YA, I love YA horror, but if you look at all of the YA horror that I really have enjoyed, none of them took place in high school or were about high school. And this is very much about high school. Pretty much all of the plot takes place in class, um, outside of class, talking about class, outside of class, talking about prom, planning prom, at school football games, at school functions. When they're not in school, they're talking about school. It's just very much about school, which is just not something that I like reading about. So I found all of that, like that plot, very boring. Once they get to prom, loved it. Loved it, amazing. But it did take a while to get there. And this did make me sort of think about my own reading, what I read for, what I'm looking for to get out of reading. And I do think that as I'm getting older, I am primarily an enjoyment-based reader. I am not just reading to be entertained. I'm like reading for enjoyment. I wanna enjoy what I'm reading. I think that there's a lot of books where enjoyment is not necessarily the intention. I don't think enjoying this book is really the intention of it. I also want to say I've never read Carrie. I wasn't going into this like comparing it to Carrie or looking for it to do anything differently or better or whatever. It was very much a clean slate for me. This did have a lot of really interesting conversations. I think one of the most interesting characters actually for me was Kenny who was like the love interest character and he is like the star football player at the school and he's black and all of his friends are white and he kind of has that role of like being not like 
the other black kids and like the one black kid that all the white students sort of use as like a token to say hey we're friends with Kenny we're not racist and like I said he is the star football player everyone's saying you know he's gonna go off to the NFL and he has a bright future and I think his character specifically had a lot of really interesting realizations around being black in America and playing football and how for a country that is so rooted in racism and anti-blackness to also be so proud and vocal of football and the NFL, which is I'm willing to guess 70% black players. There's a very interesting irony there and so I really liked Kenny's character and some of the thoughts that he was having and realizations that he was having. I think like what it comes down to is not fault of the book but like my own feelings around what I'm looking for when I read because I really would recommend this book to people. I thought for what it was intending to do it was extremely successful at that. I just don't think it's necessarily my kind of book. So I'm gonna be giving it 3.5 stars, but I do wanna say the audiobook, if I was rating just the audiobook, production, narration, 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10 audiobook. I'm gonna end up giving this 3.5 stars, which is I think what I also gave White Smoke. So I don't know, let me know at this point, knowing what I've rated both of those books. Is there something else by Tiffany D. Jackson that I should read? I know that she has like horror books and then also thrillers and I've read her horrors. So like, are her thrillers different? Do you think I would like those better? Let me know because I definitely think I would try one more of her books before I decide if she's an author for me or not. But I am glad that I read this because like I said, the audiobook was amazing and as an audiobook, connoisseur. <laughs> I am always looking for amazing audiobook productions and this one was fantastic. My number two favorite book is A Certain Hunger by Chelsea G. Summers. This is a thriller, horror, kind of. I would almost just describe it as like a general fiction. It just happens to be a general fiction story about a woman named Dorothy who is a food critic and becomes a killer and a cannibal. You've heard of Jeffrey Dahmer. You've heard of Ted Bundy, but have you heard of Dorothy Daniels? Hmm? Have you? But it was so interesting getting into the mind of this woman and like how twisted her thoughts are and where these thoughts are coming from. It's just so good and it was so dark and I love it so much. It's been a while since we talked because I've been reading A Certain Hunger. So far of all the books that I'm reading for this video, this one is taking me the longest. All of the other ones I read within like one or two days. It's been like two weeks. <laughs> this is a much slower paced, denser book, but not in a bad way. So yeah, this follows a food critic named Dorothy. And we learn at the very beginning of the book that she is currently in prison for life, for killing and eating a bunch of people and she's telling her story so this very much reads like a memoir and the narration of this book is just so perfect i don't even really know how to describe it the main character of this and the way that she's narrating it kind of reminds me of you by caroline kepnes or like the show version of you that main character joe like kills a bunch of people he's a terrible person but like his inner monologue he thinks he's a hero like he thinks he's done nothing wrong and he's very funny that kind of reminds me of Dorothy like she doesn't think she's doing anything wrong. She's just you know killing men and eating them It's such a normal thing to her and how she describes it is like it's so normal She'll go from having these long long descriptions of of food and the setting and Really zeroing in on this one aspect of something that happened that day and then when she talks about her kills, it's like so fast, blink and you miss it. Because to her, it's just like a normal thing. Like I woke up yesterday, I brushed my teeth, I murdered my boyfriend and I ate his kidney, I went for a run. Like it's no big deal. Like it's just her normal every day. As I've been reading this, I actually just watched The Menu which was such a great movie and I feel like there's a, like a, like there's there's parallels to the conversations that are happening in the menu and also happening with this book around food and consumerism and wealth and the elite and I feel like those are good pairings like a good book and movie pairing but I did finish it this morning and I oh I loved it so much I really loved this I don't know yet what I'm gonna rate it hopefully as I'm like talking out my thoughts right now that'll give me a clearer idea of if it's a four star or a five star. So yeah, like I said, it's much more of like a slower melodic book. It very much reads 
exactly like a memoir to the point where I've only ever had the same experience with one other author and that's Taylor Jenkins Reid. When I read Evelyn Hugo and Daisy Jones, those are the only books that I've read that genuinely made me feel like that main character was a real person to the point where I wanted to Google about them. I like, I just thought I would be able to Google about them and find out everything about their lives because they had to have been real people. And now with this, Dorothy feels like a real person. I wanted to look her up and like, I wanted to see videos from her trial. I wanted to read newspaper articles about her. I wanted to look at her Wikipedia page. She felt so real. I do want to read you some of my favorite quotes because just the experience of reading this book was so jarring because you would go from like some of the most insightful quotes about society, about feminism, about food, consumerism, and then Dorothy would say one of the most off the wall, funny, and just like insane things. So here are some of my favorite quotes. Few women come into maturity unscathed by the suffocating pink press of girlhood, and even psychopaths are touched by the long frilly arm of feminine expectations. It's not that women psychopaths don't exist, it's that we fake it better than men. Eat what you love, they say. And I have. I learned that being female is as prefab, thoughtless, soulless, and abjectly capitalistic as a Big Mac. It's not important that it's real. It's only important that it's tasty. Or as if killing were like potato chips. One leads to another in an endless orgy of mindless indulgence. Before you know it, the whole bag is gone and you're sitting there with gritty fingers, grease on your lips, and bathed in blood. One thing I've learned since college- <laughs> Sorry. One thing I've learned since college is that few men will suck your toes. Those who will are men of uncommon bravery, vision, and appetite. You don't let them just wander off and eat street meat. As I was reading this, I saw a Goodreads update from Stories for Coffee. I think that she described this book perfectly. She said that it is the menu meets Hannibal meets Gone Girl played by Villanelle. And that's a perfect way to sum up this book. I feel like as I'm talking about it, I'm convincing myself to give it five stars. Like I'm excited to talk about this book. I think it's five stars. Oh my God, we stand a cannibal queen. These fleeting shadows. And this is a YA thriller, I think with some horror elements. I don't think it's categorized as a horror, but it was pretty freaking scary. My reading experience specifically for this book was just pure joy. Like I was reading it and I was so excited that I actually had to pause and put down the book so that I could just bask in happiness. And that's why it's on the top list. While maybe this is not going to be a book for everyone, this book brought me so much joy that it had to be included in my top 10 list. Uh, not that it's a happy book, it's actually quite dark and, and sketchy. So well, I started These Fleeting Shadows and it's really interesting so far. It basically started with the main character saying, I'm gonna tell you this story that happened, but I have to lie to you first, which I feel like just adds this like extra layer as you're reading it where you're like, you know that there's something that the main character is keeping from you or lying to you about, but you don't know what it is and she's not trustworthy. I love an unreliable narrator. And basically the setup is that the main character and her mom ran away from their like ancestral home when she was a kid. And then something happened when she was in school as a kid, there was some sort of incident and she had to be pulled out of school and she's been homeschooled ever since. And then now her grandfather died and has requested like in his will that her and her mom come back to the home that they ran away from. And when she gets there, she finds out that her grandfather left everything to her, left her the house, all the money, but there was a clause in it that she has to live at the house for an entire year before she inherits it. And if she declines, then no one else in the family gets any of their inheritances either. So she's now forced into staying in this home that is very creepy, very scary um she gets a very weird vibe from it and her mom is like terrified of the house there was something that happened that caused them to flee when she was a kid so that's what's happening so far it's really interesting i love the setup it's very much reminding me of like uh the haunting of hill house netflix show so yeah i'm really into it i'm enjoying it i'm listening to the audiobook which is also really good because there's some spooky moments in the audiobook that actually like freaked me out the way that the narrator voices certain things. I was getting a little bit scared. 
to be honest. <laughs> I finished these fleeting shadows and I loved it. No surprise at all because I love Kate Alice Marshall. This is now the third book that I've read from her and I've loved all of them. I do think that this book is very hard to talk about, which is how I feel about all of her books that I've read so far because what's in the synopsis is like only a small percent of what's actually going on. There's always like these crazy twists and weird elements that she throws in. Her books have a lot going on. They're very hard to talk about without spoiling anything. I feel like the vibes in here were very much like the aesthetic and the family from Ready or Not. Like I was picturing this house as the house from that movie and I was picturing this family as that family. So like that vibe that family, that house, that aesthetic, but then like more Haunting of Hill House. Also then with like a little bit of Knives Out mixed in. It is like all of her books, it's very weird in the best way. It also had a sapphic romance in it that I really, really like. It's hard for me to like really recommend her books and like know who's gonna like them because they are so weird, but I feel like if you like T. Kingfisher's horror, then you will like Kate Alice Marshall's horror because they do share similarities in how weird they get, how cosmic they get. But yeah, this was great. So glad that I read it. Love Kate Alice Marshall. This is now the third book of hers that I've read and loved. So I can officially call her a favorite author, which is great. The next book, which is taken booktube, bookstagram, book talk by storm this year. Heartless. 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 If you've not heard of this book, you've been living under a rock. This book is everything that it should be, and it deserves all the freaking credit it gets. This is single dad, nanny, small town, obviously, and just a full on vibe. Everything about this book is absolute perfection. This is pretty much a perfect romance novel. It's literally on everybody's top list. I finished Heartless and as a surprise to absolutely nobody, I loved it. So basically this is following Cade who is Rhett's brother, the hero from book one. And then the heroine in this is Willa the best friend of the heroine from book one. And Cade is a single father, he is a farmer, cowboy, he has a young son, and he's looking for like a nanny to hire over the summer to take care of his son. And he's hating everybody who's applying, and then the heroine from book one decides to suggest her best friend to become the nanny. That's where it kicks off. Oh my God, I loved this. When I read the first book, I was like, so excited to read Cade's book because he was so grumpy and stoic in the first book. I was like, I am ready to see this man unravel. And unravel he did. I loved Cade, but I also really loved Willa. She was a petty queen and she called out Cade on all of his shit. She made this grumpy man beg, beg her. And I loved that. I also normally don't like kids in romance book, which I feel like is kind of counterintuitive because I love single parent romances or nanny romances, which obviously always come with kids, but the kids are very hit or miss for me. They're either super cute or super annoying. I loved the son in this book. I loved him so much. I don't know how Elsie Silver does it. She continuously makes me like tropes that I hate. But I'm in love with this small town cowboy family. I'm hooked. I'm addicted to this series. I will say, my only critique, I'm giving this 4.5 out of 5 stars. It would have been 5 stars, but there is a trope in here that I just hate and I will never like. And it's totally a me thing because I don't necessarily think the trope was done badly. It's just whenever this trope is present, I'm not gonna like it. No author is ever gonna make me like it, but the rest of the romance was five star. So it only took off that half a star where this could have been perfect, but it just had that thing that I hate. But this is so good. Definitely gonna be one of my favorite romances of the year. And I talked about this in my goals video that one of my goals this year is to be more selective with the romance that I'm reading and really, really try to read like the most quality romances and not just necessarily a large quantity of romances and this is the first romance that I've read this year and we're kicking it off with a bang. I feel like this was the perfect one to start that goal with and I, I cannot wait 
for Powerless to come out, which is gonna be the third book. I'm gonna be downloading the audiobook as soon as it comes out. And Elsie Silver is just like becoming a new favorite romance author for me. And I feel like her books are just hitting exactly how I want them to hit right now because I just moved. You can see my boxes. This is my new office. I just moved to a small town. So I'm like, I am living so happy with these small town romances right now. This was amazing. So that brings us to the end of this vlog and me reading all of these booktubers' favorite books of 2022. This went so well. We had two five stars, a 4.5 star, two four stars, and a 3.5 star. So if I'm ranking these, The Weight of Blood is on the bottom. And then I think I would go we Spread, These Fleeting Shadows, Heartless, A Certain Hunger, and Confessions. So I think this is my final ranking with Confessions being my absolute favorite. But honestly, like these three are so close and they're all so different. They're kind of equal in my eyes, even though I did give this a 4.5. These are definitely the three like top winners of the vlog. I hope you guys liked this video. If you watched this until the very, very end, um, what emoji should you leave? Let's do, ooh, let's do an anatomical heart emoji for Dorothy. <laughs> but also just a huge, huge thank you and appreciation for all of the booktubers who were featured in this video for putting out amazing content all year long. Definitely be sure to check out everybody. They're all linked in the description as well as the full playlist of all of the booktubers' favorites videos that I watched. Like I said, this is my favorite video to do all year. I'm kind of sad that it's over, but rest assured we will be back next year. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye!